These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. In the last two episodes, we've looked at mortal heroes of Canaan, which were celebrated stories that get referenced all over the Levant and even get the occasional mention in the Bible. But of the stories from Canaan, which have survived to the modern day, none are more significant than the stories of the god Baal, specifically the stories which have come down to us as the so-called Baal cycle. Now, Baal is not a round rubber toy for playing sports games with. Baal means Lord, and he was the most significant god of the Canaanites overall. Or at least, that's the general summary, except it gets way more complicated than that. First of all, there isn't just one Baal. There is a ton of them, and sometimes they even get referenced with an extra name, like Baal Hadad, Baal Hermon, Baal Hamon, Baal Shamin, and there are even female versions of the title, like the patron goddess of Byblos, Baalat Gabal, meaning Lady of Gabal, which was the local name of Byblos. Now, in some places, all these different names of Baal seem to serve as different titles of the same god. In other places, it seems that there are more than one god being called by the title Baal, which again just means Lord, and could theoretically apply to just about any and all of the many Canaanite gods who exercise a degree of lordship over their human followers. Baal gets used a lot as a name because it seems that perhaps using the actual divine name of certain gods outside of particular situations may have been frowned upon, at least in certain cities and eras. We can look to a more well-documented culture that was heavily influenced by Canaanite culture to see a similar thing. The biblical Hebrews knew the actual personal name of the god they worshipped. It was even carved into the most sacred part of Solomon's temple. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they did not call him this. They called him Adonai, meaning Lord. Actually, Adonai is the plural form of Lord, just as another name of God, Elohim, is just the plural name of the word El. But, goodness, if we get into the question of how early Hebrew monotheism came about, then poor Baal will get neglected. Anyway, Baal is a tough guy to summarize, partly because we don't always know for sure if a given text is talking about the same Baal that we want to talk about, given how vague the term sometimes is and also because of the general fragmentation of the Canaanite written record. But today we're going to tell a story about one particular Baal. And if I was going to pronounce it right, I would call him Baal Hadad, but that medial Ain, which still exists in modern Arabic, is a really unpleasant sound. And when I was studying Arabic way back when, it made me gag when there's too many of them in a row. And so we're just going to call him Baal. But before we completely lose track of his name, that Hadad is the Western Semitic version of Adad, the Mesopotamian god of storms, who entered into Mesopotamia in the Akkadian period, and is pretty much the same god in both mythologies, in charge of storms and fighting and so forth. Which helps answer the question of why our Mesopotamian podcast is covering so much Canaanite material, it's because the Akkadians, then the Amorites, and later the Arameans and Chaldeans, who will play such a big role in the Mesopotamian Iron Age, are all folks who either uh, come from Canaan or just a bit around Canaan in the sort of uh, marginal areas around the region, and are an active part of the cultural landscape of the entire Near East. Also because I like telling old stories more than I like sticking to artificial restraints like having a theme or ever getting to the point. And I certainly won't start getting to the point just yet because we should talk about the ball cycle a bit more before we actually talk about it. 
It's called the ball cycle because it's made up of a bunch of separate stories. No one's completely sure if these stories were supposed to go together or if they were supposed to go together in the order I'm about to put them in, or if some go together but others are independent tales of ball, or really we have no idea what's going on. The whole cycle, if we do take it as a complete thing, is estimated to have spanned maybe 5,000 lines of cuneiform text. That's a lot of wedges. But we only have about 1,800 lines of text still in readable format. That's a lot. This makes it one of the longer stories I've featured on here. It's going to take three episodes to get through. But also that just a bit under two-thirds of the whole text is simply missing. It makes it real hard to start the story. In places, it makes it hard to continue the story. We've seen stories that are missing the first chunk and pop in partway through the story, and that's not great, but it's not terrible either. We can work with that. But with the ball cycle, we lose the very first part. Then the first readable chunk is a pretty long segment that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And then we're just going to kind of go on to various other long segments uh, that don't always make a lot of sense. In fact, we have a number of places where the text isn't missing, but is missing enough details that even though we can read it, it's tough to know what it's saying. And I don't want to straight up quote the entire thing for you and make you figure it out. The point of oldest stories is to retell these myths and really get a handle on them. But basically what I'm saying is that some parts of this won't make a whole ton of sense. There's not much I can do about it. Uh, I can fill in some of the gaps. There's a few places where the uh, just the fragments are kind of suggestive with, with if you put everything together. Um, also, I have three translations, and I should let you know right ahead of time, these three translations don't agree with each other. Like, they don't agree with each other on very fundamental points about which letter is supposed to be where in certain places. It's not to say that these aren't really good translations by really sharp people. It's just really hard. And so I'm going to pick one, and we're going to dive in and learn what we can learn, and that'll be that. Uh, the story begins and the whole first column is gone. In fact, the whole first tablet is only barely readable. The god El, who is the father of the gods, and the god Yam, who is the god of rivers and the ocean, are having a chat about attacking somebody. Now, from the contents, this god, this someone is almost certainly Baal Hadad, the god of storms and awesomeness. Now, if we were ancient Canaanites, we would know immediately that Baal and Yam are mortal enemies, in much the same way that modern people simply know that Batman and the Joker don't quite see eye to eye on things, even if they're not comic book nerds. From what we can tell, the plan that the two are cooking up appears to be an ambush at a place called Sapan, which is sort of Ball's home mountain. Ball, in the plan, will be bound up by El. Then Yam will cut him. Ball, it seems, will probably attack Yam in the loins, and El tells Yam that he should in turn attack Ball in the loins. They then either repeat this plan to each other, which is entirely plausible given about how much ancient Semitic audiences loved repetition in their stories, or there is another round of loin attacking planned in the plan. Now this is serious loin attacking, meant as a clever stratagem, I think. I mean, this could be the Bronze Age version of America's funniest home videos, because it's Always hilarious when someone gets kicked in the balls. Anyway, we lose a bit, then we pick back up. Like, sort of like a staticky radio playing a radio drama, with El summoning a whole bunch of gods to a great feast. One interesting question I saw posed without any real solid answer was, do the Canaanite myths have a ton of feasts? Because the Canaanites 
were always having big feasts? Or is it because the Canaanites were always starving and told each other stories about feasts to cheer them up? Anyway, this discussion of this feast seems superficially very standard, except some of the word choices imply that El is actually low-key really upset. There's something about El's shame, something about the dust of destruction, something about his wine cup being filled with curdled milk. Maybe El and Yam were discussing killing Ball because he's done something naughty in the missing first column of the story. Anyway, at this feast, El announces that his son, and implicitly his heir, is henceforth to be the god Yam. Then Yam, not at all surprised by this turn of events, gives up and gives a speech that he's greatly honored by this honor, and also that he's going to drive Mighty Ball from his royal throne and maybe cut his hand off. He also seems to say that on the off chance he fails in this endeavor, Ball's going to come back and beat everyone who had any part of this big feast into a bloody pulp. The assembled gods make a great toast, and then a whole slaughterhouse of meat is wheeled in for everyone to enjoy as the static again creeps over our story. When the story returns, El is commanding that two messengers head out to the Egyptian city of Memphis, where the famous god Kothar Wachasis lives. Kothar, you may recall, is a great divine craftsman who lives in Egypt for some reason, probably because the Egyptians were better craftsmen than the Canaanites. Anyway, the messengers very politely ask Kothar to run really fast over to somewhere, a mountain called K.S., no idea what vowels should be involved there. And at that mountain, he's supposed to build a massive new palace for Yam, since he's been elevated to Divine Prince or something like that. Uh, then we get puzzling and obscure lines where the messengers actually tell their message, saying, For a message, I have the following and will recite to you. A word I will recite to you. The word of tree and the whisper of stone. The word that travels from heaven to hell and from the ocean depths to the stars. The word that people do not know, earth's masses do not understand. Come, I will reveal it. The word is... And the next line is unreadable, which is probably why the modern world is devoid of great and sacred wisdom, because we don't know what that magic word is. Anyway, Kothar says, no problem, and immediately understands the significance of whatever the sacred word is that he's just been told. And even though Egypt is very far away from this mountain, somehow being two or three times farther away than the length of the entire world, he can run really fast and get there in no time. Then, sure enough, next thing we know, Kothar is at El's throne room and kneeling down. El then tells Kothar to build a palace. And we're pretty sure that Kothar eventually just goes and does it once everyone gets bored of talking all the time. El, meanwhile, has not gotten bored of talking all the time and fires off another message, this one to the goddess Anat, who we met last episode as a passionate lady of great passion. Apparently, Anat has been, been a bit too passionate lately, probably related to whatever Baal was doing to upset El, and seems to have started a war somewhere. El tells her to bury her war and give up her love, which is basically saying to abandon her two favorite things and instead fill the earth with peace and tranquility. He then tells her to hurry and run to El's mountain. What's she supposed to do there? Probably apologize and, you know, get with the program, but we're not really sure. Then, in the next fragment... El and Yam do some more scheming and work on building the palace, or more likely give a whole bunch of orders while relaxing and watching others work. And that's the end of the first tablet. Keep in mind that this tablet 
may not have anything to do with any of the other tablets. This may have been a completely independent story where Ball and a gnat irritate El and Yam, and then after sending a bunch of messages, it may have been resolved. However, because we have another tablet which can be read as carrying along certain events, this tale of Ball and Yam does seem to continue on further. And indeed, that's how all the tablets in the Ball cycle are. They, they sort of go together, and so we sort of stuck them together. But who really knows? Anyway, Tablet 2 is a bit broken at the start, and when it does open up again, it seems we're dealing with a tablet from a different author, because he covers some of the same ground we've already seen. But in not exact repetition is why we think it's a different author. Anyway, Kothar the Craftsman is hurrying to El's court to bow before El and get instruction for building a great palace to the god Yam. I mean, it is possible that this is just repetition that the ancient Semitic audiences loved so very much. But other than learning that the palace, the place of the palace, may be a spot called Judge River, which may or may not accord with the fragments in Tablet 1, we don't really get much out of this brief episode before we can't read it anymore. But then we get to the Divine Lamp Shapshu having a chat with her buddy Aftar. Now, both of these are interesting gods in a wider context. Shapshu, called the Divine Lamp, is a female Canaanite version of a god we're very familiar with, Shamash, the Mesopotamian sun god, who was literally the sun in the same way that Shapshu is, though somehow Shapshu has become female. Attar, similarly, is the planet Venus, though of course they thought of him as the morning star, one particular light in the sky, not as a body orbiting the sun or anything like that. Anyway, the two of them appear to be gossiping about what is going on among the can we say, more important gods? Since Shapshu, perhaps because she is a lady, is far less important than her counterpart Shamash ever was. Interestingly, both of these deities would go on to play roles in the pre-Islamic Arabian pagan religion, but that's not actually relevant to anything. Shapshu, the divine lamp, is telling Attar, the morning star, that Attar's father, El, will be taking vengeance for whatever offense the Baal faction has committed. Attar, who is apparently some sort of divine king at the moment, acknowledges that, yeah, he probably can't step up to El if El chooses to remove Attar from the throne. And he's probably just going to have to humbly accept whatever happens to him. Interestingly, he says in this part that as part of his humbling, he may have to accept getting washed in the river, an act that may have had symbolic associations with what would later become baptism in the Jewish tradition, but also represents a direct submission to Yam, who is not only the god of rivers and oceans, but he is the very rivers and oceans that he rules over. Then they discuss what Shapshu is going to do about all this, though it isn't clear what her response is, and the bit gets lost. When we can read it again, Baal is sending a message to Yam. We can't make too much of it, but it seems that, at least in Baal's opinion, he did not deliver an insult to El and Yam. Rather, it seems that Yam has risen in rebellion against Baal's rightful kingship. Baal makes a couple standard threats, hoping that Horon, who is basically the god of cursing, smashes Yam's head and invokes various other gods to threaten Yam. This bit's a bit odd, at least to my ears. When mortals curse each other, we use the curses of various gods, and it seems relatively natural. A powerless human is invoking the gods to give pain on another powerless human. But for a self-styled king of gods to be cursing in the same way, it just seems weird, almost like he's calling these gods as members of his army or something. Anyway, we could barely read this section, and then Yam sends some sort of response. 
But his response doesn't go to Baal, or if it does, we don't, don't have his direct response to Baal. Instead, he sends a message to his father, El, telling his messengers to go in such a hurry that they're not even to waste time being polite when they reach El's court. This may not only be a matter of haste, though. Messengers in the ancient world are, in some circumstances, to a certain degree, treated as extensions of the person whose message they're carrying. And thus Yam, since he's now divine king, may believe that the standard obeisances are inappropriate for his messengers. And sure enough, we see that when the messengers enter the divine court of El, where basically all the gods are currently gathered, they burst right into the feast and stand imperiously before all the gods as emissaries of Yam. Baal is there, acting as the personal servant of El. And here we really feel the lack of context that helps us make sense of the scene. Honestly, I found in my three translations that uh, each one of these treats this feast a little differently. Is Baal serving El? Perhaps trying to get into his good graces after an offense? or perhaps just as an acknowledgement that El, at least, is superior to Baal? Or is El here like a medieval cupbearer, a position of honored subordination? Or a third possibility, is Baal not serving at all, but standing next to El, shoulder to shoulder, like a strong right hand, or perhaps even as an equal? Whatever the case, Everyone at the feast sees the messengers of Yam and are immediately aware that they come from the newly crowned king of gods. The whole audience kneels and lowers their heads to their upper knee in respect. Everyone at least, except for Baal. Baal calls out to them, asking why they would ever consider abasing themselves so. The assembled gods are like, dude, these are the messengers of Yam. Chill out. Be respectful. Baal, however, tells them all to stand and that he will personally hand her whatever the messengers have to say. The assembled gods are impressed by Baal's courage and willingness to step forward here, and they all rise. The messengers approach El at this point. And as expected, they refuse to bow to him or the high council of gods. It should be noted that while it isn't stated, it's probably implied that El almost certainly was not among the gods who kneeled to these messengers. Anyway, as the arrogant messengers recite the message given to them by Yam, their speech is so nimble that their mouths shoot fire and their tongues become sharp swords. As awesome and cinematic as this sounds, it's almost certainly meant metaphorically, and all in all, their demand is that the assembled gods must arrest and hand over Baal, son of Dagon, so that Yam may humble him and steal all his gold. El basically says, sure, no problem. El announces that Baal is to be the slave of Yam and to deliver a whole bunch of gold to Yam's palace. Baal is a bit put out by this announcement and immediately flies into a rage. Baal pulls two swords out from somewhere, and dual-wielding like a champ, he charges in and strikes the two messengers. The gods Anat and Athart are able to get in there and grab Baal's left and right hands to restrain him, while they rebuke him that he's not to strike the messengers of Yam. It isn't super clear if these messengers died or not, but the offense is clear, and El's judgment that Baal is to be turned over to Yam for justice is confirmed. Someone, either Yam or Baal or perhaps both, make grand speeches about how they're going to bring the annihilator Hadu down on their opponent and cause them to bow down before him. Overblown threats are always fun, but there really isn't enough surviving here to make out much. Somewhere, Ball escapes from the apparent imprisonment. More threats are exchanged in the build-up to war. 
These threats end with Yam promising to be the sieve of destruction and the breast of death. Yam will destroy Baal's sword and burn his house down. And the goddess Astarte, who's apparently listening with delight, calls out at the conclusion of the speech that Baal will sink beneath Yam's throne. Bearing in mind that Yam's throne is a river, so Baal is being threatened with drowning. These threats, it seems, are being delivered to Baal's face now. The two enemies are like standing in some sort of room together, screaming in each other's faces, while a whole bunch of other gods are standing around, backing one side or the other. Fortunately for Baal, who is our hero in all of this, if that wasn't clear, he has the backing of the great divine craftsman, Kothar Wachasis. Kothar tells Baal that Baal is the great cloud rider, and all he needs to do is smash the enemy, and he can take eternal kingship. To make it easier for Baal to smash said enemy, he crafts a pair of weapons on the spot and tosses the first one to Baal while calling out a benediction for the weapon. The first of these weapons is named Yagarish, and it's specifically crafted to drive Yam from his throne. The weapon Yagarish leaps from Baal's hand like a raptor from his fingers, with the grace of a bird of prey taking flight, and strikes the torso of Prince Yam straight between his two arms. But Yam is tough and takes the blow like a man, or perhaps like a god. And Kothar tosses the other weapon to Baal, who's apparently still in motion. Baal catches the second weapon in the air, while Kothar shouts that this sword's name is Ayamari. Baal swings around and again with hawk-like grace smacks that sword right on Baal Yam's head, right between the eyes. This is a killing blow. Yam collapses and falls to the earth. On the off chance that Yam was thinking to maybe get up again after this, Baal takes no chances and begins hacking Yam to pieces and pulls the pieces away from each other. The sea and river god is thoroughly dead. Immediately, the goddess Astarte, who appears to have been in Yam's camp, rebukes Baal, saying that he was supposed to take Yam as a captive not chop him up into pieces like a psycho, to which Baal appears to respond by chopping Yam into even more tiny pieces and scattering the pieces across the earth. This is not a subtle statement of intent, and some gods whose name are too damaged to read get the hint. They take turns crying out that Yam is dead and now Baal reigns as divine king. Hip, hip, hooray, the king is dead. Long live the king. And thus ends Tablet 2, with Baal's victory and restoration to heavenly king being celebrated. And here, with Baal's victory and the end of the second tablet, we'll draw today's story to a close. But this is not the end of the Baal cycle. And in fact, much of what comes next is far better preserved. We can tell much more of the story in detail. So join us next time for what should be a peaceful interlude in our story, but actually turns out to be super weird with some gods be demanding cannibalism and other gods doing household chores, all around the occasion of what may or may not be Ball's victory feast and the construction of his new palace. Thank you for listening.